Hi, my name is Dr. George Hillman, and what I want to do in the next couple of moments is talk about a leadership theory that is called situational leadership. The best way to explain this theory is to use the analogy of learning how to ride a bike. So watch the video for the next couple of minutes, and then we'll talk about the video. The number of people riding bikes to work has gone up more than 60% in the past decade, but it's not an option for some adults. Maria Villarreal is in New York City with how classes are helping adults learn how to ride a bike for the first time. Maria, good morning. Well, good morning. We are actually on one of the busiest bikeways in America, the Hudson River Park. And you know, even for some of the pros, these bike lanes back here can be a little bit difficult. But we attended one class here in New York City where beginners are learning how to ride a bike, and it is incredible to see. Everybody looks pretty good. So go next to your bike. On a recent afternoon in New York City, more than 20 adults gathered to participate in what's traditionally seen as a childhood rite of passage. This was a goal for my 12th birthday. <laughs> and, you know, we just waited a little longer. At 33 years old, Amani Mosin was looking to experience that freedom only a bike can provide. Don't even think about the pedals at the moment. She traveled from New Jersey to the city's Lower East Side to take a free adult biking class. When I walked into the registration, it was very refreshing to see adults, you know, and it wasn't 12 year old kids learning how to ride a bike. It was people just like me. According to YouGov, a global research firm, about 13% of adults in the U.S. between the ages of 18 and 34 don't know how to ride a bike. Cycling has become a really big thing. Ida Sama Rivera is an instructor for Bike New York, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching adults and kids how to ride. The fact that we have new bike paths in New York, I think, has also kind of spurred that. More people are seeing that they want to learn how to ride because of that. Across the country, more cities are making streets bike friendly. An eight mile trail is being built around downtown Indianapolis. In Louisville, Kentucky, workers are breaking ground on a 100-mile network of bike lanes through neighborhoods. And more than 70 major cities now have bike-sharing programs or are preparing to launch soon. It's just good for a city to have a good bicycling culture. Bill Strickland is the editor-in-chief of Bicycling Magazine. Government officials have realized that cycling is kind of an indicator species. If they're cycling in a city, it's generally a vibrant, young population. So groups in the U.S. are now offering adult riding classes. At Bike New York, students start off with the basics. Keep your eyes looking ahead. Slippery. The pedals are initially removed from the bikes, but once they show instructors that they can glide and balance, they get them back. And that's when the real fun begins. We can be as a group at the beginning, but then when we really get them on the bike, it's, it's kind of a one by one. I call it popcorn kernels, you know, they start popping one by one, then it gets more individual. Amani took a little longer than some of the other students in her class. As you're on this bike, what are you telling yourself? Uh, I'm praying <laughs> in my head to uh, just to be successful. I'm telling myself you should be proud that you're even here. And I'm just trying to look up and, and think of only positive thoughts. But once she got the hang of things, it was an emotional ride. Congratulations, come on, let's go back my first home. I hate to call it out, but <laughs> yeah. tears. Yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's something I just want to do, but that's all. <laughs> it's, it's happy tears. My dad tried to teach me he's not alive. Like, it would be really cool to, like, do it and know that, like, I'm just kind of moving forward. <laughs> you were thinking of him, weren't you, yeah. on this bike? You think he'd be proud? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Amani does plan to go back for a second class, which is not uncommon. They actually say the first class is all about the basics, and the second class is all about uh, the confidence, Nora. What a wonderful story. Go, Amani. Yes, yeah, go you on. can do it. And yeah. her pride. Yeah. So when I show this video in my class, I usually ask the students in the class, what did you hear, what did you see, or what did you feel as you watch that video? And, and I'll tell you th three things in my own life. Number one is, I guess I assume that everybody knows how to ride a bicycle, but that is really not the case. And maybe even some of you who are watching the video, you could relate to that lady because maybe for whatever circumstances, you never learned to ride a bicycle. 
The second thing that I watch in that video is taking off the pedals. I think that is pure genius. Uh, I never had thought about taking off the pedals to learn how to ride a bicycle. But then the final thing, and the thing we're going to talk about in this presentation, is the lady who is actually learning how to ride a bicycle. Uh, she's in her 30s. She probably has a great career. She's a smart lady. Yet for this one task, she just doesn't know how to do this one task. She's not dumb. She's not stupid. She just doesn't know how to use, do this task. And so it takes someone to come alongside her to understand the situation that this person is in and then respond accordingly. And in this case, what's the response? We're going to take off the pedals. We're going to start at the beginning. That's what situational leadership is. Let me give you an example of my own life. Uh, this summer, I replaced the back door of my house. Now, this isn't a picture of my own house, but this looks very similar to what I did. When you are getting ready to tackle a project like this, the first thing that most people do today is they go to YouTube and they start looking at videos. And so I went to YouTube and I searched replace back door and I found a video made by one of the big box uh, hardware stores. And the video said that I could be able to do this in four hours. It took me two and a half days to do a four hour project according to this expert. Um, I'm a professor. I think I'm a smart guy. I just did not know how to do this task. So I was a beginner for this task. And because I was a beginner, it took me a little bit longer. It took me, uh, I had to go a little bit slower. It would have been really nice to have had an expert there who could have walked alongside me. So based on the task, how capable is the person and how confident is the person? And then we're going to respond accordingly. That is the model of situational leadership. The authors behind situational leadership, there's actually two. Ken Blanchard, you see the book here, and this is the model that I'm going to be presenting to you today. And there's another model by Paul Hershey. Actually, these two gentlemen, Ken Blanchard and Paul Hershey, worked together in the 1960s and 1970s, and both of them developed this model. Uh, and both of them have just slight variations between the two of them, but either model is going to have the same basic principles. And here's how to think about the principles. You as a leader, you have two tools in your toolbox. One is how directive you're going to be. And what you see at the bottom is directive, uh, being task focused, giving direction, giving structure, giving timelines to people that are following you. It's one way communication. It is you talking to your followers. And if they're doing something wrong, it's coming alongside and correcting them. That's a very directive um, type of uh, leadership. Are there times and places for that? Of course there are. But there's also supportive leadership. That's the other tool. And you see that's people focused. And you see some of the things here of being able to support the people. It's collaboration. It's inspiration. It's two-way communication. The leader is speaking to the followers, but the followers are also responding back to the leader. And what we want to do as a leader in that context is we want to create self-reliant problem solving. What we want to have happen is that the actual followers come up with their own creative solutions of how to fix the problem. So you as a leader, you have a choice of how directive am I going to be or how supportive I'm going to be. And different people in different contexts, different circumstances are going to respond differently. And if you use the wrong tool at the wrong time, it's not going to turn out well. So here's my illustration about bikes. Um, I have a Spider-Man bike here. I'm partial to Spider-Man. Now, you might have had your own bike when you were a little kid, and it was a Spider-Man or Batman or Superman. Maybe it was a Disney princess bike or a Barbie bike. But think about Christmas morning, and think about how excited you were when you got a, your first bicycle. Now, you didn't know how to ride the bicycle, but you were excited about riding the bicycle. And so your parents would show you how to ride the bicycle. They probably took you out Christmas morning, and you see training wheels on here, and maybe you had training wheels or something like this. This is what we're talking about with a beginning leader. And in the model, it's called a D1 follower, an enthusiastic beginner. And here's some words to think about. This person's hopeful. This person's curious. You were very curious about how does a bicycle work. They're inexperienced, but they're very optimistic. They're excited. And this person is so eager to learn. When you got that bicycle on Christmas morning, you were so eager to go outside and to learn how to ride the bicycle. So as you see at the bottom, doesn't quite know what to, is expected, but they're interested and they're excited. 
So again, think about the video that we just watched. This lady drove from New Jersey. She was excited about riding a bicycle, but she didn't know how to ride a bicycle. So if that's your follower, then you as a leader, it's a directing type of leadership. And so I have some bullet points here. The leader in this circumstance, they're defining what the roles are and what the responsibilities are. My dad, in teaching me how to ride a bicycle, he was the teacher and I was the learner. And he told me where to put my feet on the pedals, how fast to go, how slow to go, how to use the brakes. The leader tells what tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. The leader is making the decision the leader is constantly checking and monitoring, and the leader is giving immediate feedback. So again, as you watch that video and you watch the instructor literally running beside that lady who's learning how to ride her bicycle, and she's giving immediate feedback and instruction of, well, do this and do that. That's a style of leadership, and you see that it's very high on the directive end and a little bit lower on the supportive end. Not not being not mean what it means by supportive is that you as the leader are taking more of the control of the situation and the follower in this case the person learning how to ride the bicycle you're just receiving that instruction well you get the bicycle you get out you get on the street and you know what happens you're gonna fall and when you fall off the bicycle the first time you don't you lose a little bit of that excitement this hurts the concrete hurts and maybe you're thinking to yourself oh why did I even think I could ride a bicycle this is stupid I don't ever want to ride a bicycle again and so your mom or dad or the person you're learning has to come alongside you and pick you back up encourage you say hey let's get back on the bike and let's try it again and again as you are watching those individuals in the video learning how to ride their bicycles again they're following they're not doing it perfectly the first time and the teacher does a little bit different role than when you just first get your bicycle so here's some words to think about you have this new task but you're overwhelmed you're confused you're demotivated um, you're frustrated maybe you're ready to quit discouraged but what you see in the person is you see flashes of competence so as this lady is learning to ride her bicycle in New York City there's flashes of competence you see that she can do this she just needs a little bit more encouragement so you see the description at the bottom of this is called a D2 follower a disillusioned learner starting to understand the skill or the task but they may be scared they may be bored or they may be resistant so what kind of leadership do you need in this model? Well, for this, what you need is a coach. And some of the descriptions here for a coach. It's a, the leader maintains control, but the leader is open to suggestions. So if I am teaching my child how to ride a bicycle and my child falls, I want to ask my child, okay, what did you not understand? How can I help you? What are you not understanding? What are you not getting? The followers feel heard. And the leader explains clarifies and praises and you see it's high on the directive still the leaders in control but it's very high on the supportive because I want to hear back from the person of what are they not understanding how can I encourage them along the way well you've got your bicycle you got it on Christmas morning you spent all that spring season learning how to ride your bicycle and you got more confidence those training wheels come off and then you go to the big hill. Now, this is a mountain bike and you know, you're seeing this huge hill. Maybe it was the hill at the end of the block. A little bit faster speed and you got up there that first time and you're looking down the hill and you're thinking to yourself, okay, am I ready for this? Uh, maybe you got a little scared. You, you were great at riding bicycles on the flat ground, but now you have a new challenge that's before you. So some of the things to think about this, self-critical, you started riding on the flat ground, but now you're doing something much more challenging and now you're starting to think, well, maybe I'm trying to tackle too much. Maybe you've become a little bit doubtful about your experiences. Um, in an organization, this person's still contributing. This person can do the task, but maybe they're feeling insecure. They're tentative, unsure, they're hesitant. Um, maybe they're just bored, apathetic. Maybe one of the things is that you got bored riding your bicycle on the same sidewalk and so you wanted a little bit more of a challenge. So you see the description of this follower at the bottom. This is capable but a cautious performer. This person understands the system. They're willing to engage the system but they may be scared 
or they may not like the process. So this person has been serving for a while, maybe in your organization, and now you've asked them to step up to the next big challenge. You know that they can do it, but they're scared. Or this is a person that's been doing the same thing for a while and they need a new challenge because they're getting bored in what they're doing. So you as a leader, what does that look like? Well, that's a supporting role. In a supporting role, we're going to solve problems together. Me as the leader and the follower, we're going to sit down together and how can we solve this problem together? The leader is asking much more open-ended questions. This person has been serving for a while and so as a result, this person maybe has some suggestions of how to do it even better. The leader is giving reassurance. There's mutual trust and respect. I trust and respect you as the follower because you've shown me that you're competent in the past. And the leader's authentic. Maybe I'm starting to share my own stories of things that I've struggled with doing a task that's similar. But, and the leader's also providing rationale for the change. This is why we're asking you to do this in a different way, and I'm here to support you. I'm here to encourage you. Well, the final illustration in this is you finally get to be that expert on the bicycle. I just got through watching the Summer Olympics, and I was amazed watching these experts, the best in the world, as they were riding their various road races. At this point, I kind of want to get out of the way and let this expert do what they do best. And so what you see for words for this is they're justifiably confident. This is not an arrogance, but this person's excellent at what they do and they can do it time and time again. They're consistently competent. They're inspired and then they actually inspire other. Other, other people look to this person in the organization and actually want them to be a role model for them on how to do this task. They're recognized as an expert. They want to be autonomous. They want you to let them do, let them get out, let you get out of the way and let them do what they do best. And they are very accomplished at what they do. And so you see at the bottom, there's a high competence and there's a high commitment. And for that one, it's delegation. The follower is responsible. The follower has authority. The leader empowers. The leader challenges the follower. And the leader is going to stay informed but really the follower is running that ministry or running that organization. And I have here at the bottom, I say that this is not dumping. Um, there's delegation and there's dumping. Dumping is when you just hand off the task, but you have not trained the person and you don't keep informed of what that person is doing. What we're asking is, is for you as the leader to train these people, but then to stay in constant contact with them of how they are doing. So what you have here is that we have the four different models or four different modes of leadership, of directing, coaching, super, uh, supporting, and delegating. And what you see is on the bottom are colors that match those four modes. And again, think about our bicycles. You get your bicycle on Christmas morning, you're excited, but you've never learned how to ride a bicycle before. So you see that's low competence, but very high commitment. You go outside, it's Christmas morning, you're going, you're riding your bicycle, but then you fall off your bicycle and you get a little discouraged and may frustrated and maybe you want to quit. There's low to some competence because we know you can do it, but there's a low commitment. There matches up with coaching. You get the bicycle, you're riding around for a while, and then you go to that next big hill. And you get to the top of the hill and now you're wondering, have I over, have I, am I doing too much? And you get a little scared. There's moderate to high competence. You're, an ex, you're a good bicycle rider and maybe an excellent bicycle rider, but there's a variable commitment uh, based on the situation. Or the last one, you're that Olympic bicycle rider and you just want to get out of the way and let that person ride. That's delegation and as I said, that's different than dumping. What I want to talk about just very briefly is what you see here with over-supervision and under-supervision. So that S1, S2, that directing or coaching, if you're trying to do those things with people who are very, very competent in what they do, that's over-supervising. Over that's micromanaging the person. Um, if you're trying to coach this person like you're teaching them to ride a bicycle on Christmas morning, yet this person's been riding a bicycle for years, they're going to resent that. You have to lead appropriately. Under supervision, you maybe are that S3, S4 that's supporting or that delegating, yet you've got somebody who's never learned how to do the task before. So again, you're thinking they know how to ride the bicycle, but they've never known how to ride a bicycle. And so that's 
under supervision. You want to respond appropriately to the person. And once again, this is task focused. Think about the video. That lady is probably very capable in lots of different things. She just didn't know how to ride a bicycle or think about my house. I hope I'm capable in a lot of different things. I had just never replaced the back door of my house before. And so you need to respond accordingly. I'm not a huge golf player, but people tell me who are big golfers that it's all about club selection. So when you watch golf or if you are a golfer, you know that there's all kinds of different clubs for different situations. And you want to find the right club for the situation. Uh, you see a driver here, so if you're starting off, a driver is great. But if you're on the green, getting ready to make a hole, a driver is terrible. You need the right club based on the situation. And so with situational leadership, you want to know your followers and be able to respond accordingly.